But we are in this Christmas season, and we've been doing this series entitled How to Build a Manger. And guess what? Our intern, Maggie, finally got it right. We have a manger. This is awesome. So such an incredible thing. I, never, I didn't think she'd finish it. If you weren't with us, every week we've been waiting to get a manger. And this new intern that we hired, she's just been having trouble doing that. And uh, now I see the manger is here. And really this series is not just about a manger, but about how to put Jesus in the center of everything, and today we have our manger there, and well. Pastor Dave, Pastor Dave, Pastor Dave, Pastor Dave, Pastor oh, Dave, boy. Pastor Dave, wait, 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 wait. <sighs> Just wait. Okay. Hi, Maggie. Hey. How are you? I'm. What are you doing here? I'm. A... Oh. Man, I'm so sorry. My timing is always off. Maggie, I'm not sure if your timing is off, but your outfit is really off. What? Is, what is, you don't like it? I, I mean, I like it, but it, you know it's Christmas Eve and, oh, you know, right. dress up a little well, bit. Well, here's the thing. Here's yeah. the thing. Yeah. I'm really into this building thing. I see I that. mean, we have a manger. I did it. I completed the project. And, you know, I don't want to just talk the talk. I want to walk the walk. Okay. Also well, in some heels. So it's I, still me, you know, but, no, but wait, I'm doing I, it. I'm really doing you, it. <laughs> you have boots with high heels. Maggie's got to stay true to Maggie. <laughs> this is awesome. Can we thank Maggie for building this amazing manger? And rocking the, I mean, it's incredible. It's really, good job, Maggie. It's, yeah, yeah. it's really something. But I, I, what are you doing here? Right, right. Because it I, is Sunday. Yeah, it, Remember um, the one day okay. of the week I work? Yes, Review, yes. Go over um, it. it was and, nice to see you the last week one time. But well, anyway, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. What am I doing here? What, I don't know. I, you know, I don't, I came up here for something to do with this, I think, but I don't, I don't remember. Okay. You know, my mind is just so filled with all the things that I've been learning this okay. whole past month. It's just been amazing. I just, I can't remember little Tell things us. right okay. now. Okay, tell us what, I mean, you've, you've done a lot. This is, by the way, amazing. Thank After you. last yeah. week, I wasn't sure that this was gonna happen, but. It's I mean, the outfit. What's been going on? Maybe it's the outfit. Do you have a moment? Do you mind if I, oh, you know what? We don't have service tonight. You have all the time in the world. All right, so. I, you're here anyway, so go ahead. Let me tell you what has happened. Yeah. So about a month ago, you came to me and asked me to do this project, and I really thought, no, I'm not building a manger. I had a really bad attitude. And then you gave me the blueprints, yep. and when I followed them, they actually were awesome. Yep. So thank you for that. And then the pile of materials that we had delivered here, I thought nothing was going to come of it. But I used them, and it worked. And I changed my attitude and look what we have. Yeah. Can we look at it? Yeah, huh? yeah. It is great. I is mean, it's, it? it's, it's solid. It's even sturdy. It's good, and, right? Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. I mean, last week, I don't know how you did this. this I know, incredible. it's so good, you know? It's really and good, yeah. It's, it just, it does make for a nice little backdrop. And well, I remember what I'm missing. Okay. I'll, I'll be back. Oh, okay. I, yeah, I, I got it. I remember. Okay, well, I guess um, I'll be here. And while I'm here, maybe I'll preach a service today. Never know what's going to happen with Maggie, but we thank the Lord for today. Amen? Amen. Come on, thank the Lord for Maggie. So we have a manger, and today I want to talk to you about the big reveal, because it's not enough to have a manger Something's still missing, isn't it? How to build a manger. I want to share some scripture with you today that's going to be very familiar to you. After all, it is Christmas Eve. And it's an incredible time to hear once again a story that has literally changed our lives. And I love it today that we have the children in the room because if you notice today, the room does not sound stale and sterile it sounds alive. Can I get an amen? amen? And church, that's a good thing when the church is alive. Come on, give the Lord praise for that. <laughs> See, I think sometimes we try to button everything up at Christmas time, 
and we try to make tradition work the way tradition should be, but just like today, tradition is nothing if we don't celebrate it with the ones we love. In the same way, Christmas is nothing unless we remember the real purpose and the real presence that needs to be a part of this Christmas season. We've been talking, if you haven't been with us, it's okay. I'll catch you right up to speed today as if you were. We've been talking about building a manger means building our life in such a way that Jesus is alive in us at the center of every desire and every decision. And just like Maggie has been needing to learn how to trust the blueprints and understand what raw materials were needed, and then she had to pick up her hammer and get to work, in the same way, building a life centered around Jesus takes the same intention. Let me make the illustration to you today complete. Building a life centered around Jesus doesn't come naturally. Have you noticed that? Life has a way of robbing us of the spiritual in replace of the natural because when we open our eyes in the morning, our eyes and our ears and our life consumes us with the temporal. And if we're not careful, whether we've heard of Jesus or not, we will spend our lives engaged in the things of this life and miss the significance of a God who is calling out to us, saying there is more to this life. There is more than what our eyes see and our ears hear. So building a life centered around Jesus is accomplished when, first of all, we trust God's unique plan for our life. In other words, God has a plan, a master plan, and that plan involves saving the world, but it also involved you. You are a part of the story. God can develop a plan where all of humanity from all time is incorporated into that plan, and we get to come into the plan, but the ending is not determined. That's up to us, the ending of our story, that is. God has his ending that's already confirmed, and he knew what he was going to do, but we join the plan or we miss the plan based on our own decisions, whether we're consumed with this world or we're interested in what God wants for our life. And then we need to understand that we are the raw materials that God chooses to use. You and I, this is an incredible statement. It's a very theological statement, if you'll allow me to say that today. The fact that us as humans, with all of our flaws, can actually be a part of God's plan. That's an incredible statement. And either you believe me today, or you would look at that statement if you maybe never heard it before and go, that's an incredible statement about God, that he wants to include us in his plan by giving us an invitation to be a part of his work and his kingdom on the earth. And then finally, just like it wasn't enough just to know the plan and know the raw materials, we have to be willing to do what God has called us to do. See, while the plan of God is determined, what you do about that plan is not determined. God does not control what we do with his plan. Some days I wish he would. Most days I'm glad that he leaves it up to us. But when I screw it up really bad in my life, I wish, God, couldn't you just have uh, just intervened in that moment for me and just help me not do that boneheaded thing? The reality is we all need God, but God leaves the choices of how we will do things up to us. So let me give you just quickly today, we know you've got plans for Christmas, you know, you know, we know you're ready to go, you've got the list, this is just one on the list, so we want to get you out of here today, but I believe it's important on Christmas Eve. This glorious day, to, I, I appreciate that you've made the time like my family has made the time. You might say, I had to be here, but I wanted to be here, amen? And the reality is we're making time for something that's critical while we're not gonna be here for hours and hours. These moments together, I believe, can be really valuable and really important and maybe the most important of what we do over the next 24 hours. And I love that you are here today, kids. You're part of this. 
There's a lot of confusing messages about what Christmas is about, and I hope for us today that before we leave, we would remember with real clarity that while all the other stuff is good, the presents, I love those parts of Christmas. They are wonderful, beautiful parts of Christmas, the, the ornaments and the tree and all the celebrations around Christmas, but at the end of the day, without Jesus, in the middle of those things, they would be pointless, meaningless, and lifeless. Let me make this point from the scripture for a few minutes today, and today I want to do something that I don't know if I can do justice to in just a few minutes, but I would like to give you the blueprint of God for why he, in the first place, created Christmas. So let's think about it this way, God's blueprint. We've been talking about blueprints and raw materials and getting it done. Well, I'm here to tell you today that God has done that from the beginning, and it's why we can celebrate Christmas today. God's blueprint, we read in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11, that the, the story of Jesus, this introduction of Jesus, was an eternal purpose says that God accomplished an eternal purpose. That means before we sinned, before we were born, God knew that by giving us free choice, we would sin and we would choose wrongly, but it's important that we have free choice because people often say, why is there evil in the world? Well, there's evil because there's free choice, and there's free choice because without free choice, it couldn't be real love, and it couldn't be real obedience, and there could be no real worship unless we have that choice. And so God creates the choice knowing it will result in evil, but knowing also that he will make a way. He has an internal purpose from the beginning of time for how he will redeem you and I. And it says here in Ephesians 3 that he, he accomplishes it in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Doesn't accomplish it through you just doing better or, or going to church. or The Bible does not teach that. It teaches that the only way to be a part of the eternal purpose of God is to do it through his son, Jesus, through the provision that he has made according to the scriptures. Isaiah 7, 14, he announces this 800 to 1,000 years before Jesus is ever born. He speaks by the Spirit to Isaiah the prophet, and he says, I'm going to give you a little peek into my plan, and we read it in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, which we all know means God with us. So God has a plan. He speaks it out to the world. He begins to introduce it and, and speak it in mysteries throughout the Old Testament. But Jesus is coming. I'm going to send one who's going to be born of a virgin who will be called God with you. He will be, a, he will be me with you. And then we see the raw materials. Time passes and we begin to see that God is not going to just do it himself and introduce it to him, but he's going to use humanity to bring his Savior through other humans who are going to help him bring his presence to the earth. And so we see the raw materials. We see Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 30. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus, most likely the first time that name would be uttered on the earth, and Mary gets to hear it. Mary, who is in every sense a normal human, favorite of God, but not different than others, and God calls her out, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. All of these are messianic fulfillments. Let there be no doubt that God was declaring that Jesus truly was what the Jews had been waiting for. He was the Messiah, the, the coming king who would come and save his people. Verse 34, Mary says, how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Let there be no doubt, God, according to the Word of God, was bringing His Son, which was 100% God, to the earth. 
Then we see Joseph, another part of the raw materials. Joseph, we see that God chooses to use Joseph, again, another ordinary person, a man. In Matthew 1.20, when Joseph finds out that his wife is pregnant, or his soon-to-be wife, he, seem, he is going to just do the proper thing and, and, and have a quiet uh, divorce, as would have been the custom. And instead, in verse 20, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. God making his plan known to the raw materials, you and I, humans. What about the other raw materials of the place in Bethlehem? He chooses small, insignificant Little city, the smallest of the tribe. He chooses two ordinary people. He chooses regular people at a regular place, a little out-of-the-way place, as a matter of fact. And in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, again, hundreds if not a thousand or more years before the birth of Jesus, God is giving just a small plan, and he talks about Bethlehem in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So out of you will come one who is already been, <laughs> one who is eternal. That is Jesus. And then God gets it done. He doesn't stop there. Let's go to Luke chapter 2 today. Can we read this familiar passage? And today we're going to be moving to a candlelight service in just a few moments and have opportunity for, to light candles around the room and to sing and to celebrate this special occasion. But as we prepare for that today, would you prepare your hearts for what the Lord would want to do in you? Here's the big reveal. The moment when God gets it done, Luke chapter 2 verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus, Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. We'll skip to verse 3. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, where he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there... The time came for the baby to be born. I want to stop right there for just a moment. From the beginning of time, God had a plan. Man comes on the scene in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve sin. They are separated from God, but God still has a plan for them. Hundreds and thousands of years. God has a plan. He reveals it to Isaiah, to Micah, to others. I have a plan to redeem my people. He gives them types and pictures like the tabernacle and the temple. Sacrifices all pointing ahead. And then a day comes. The time is right. The time is fulfilled. And Mary and Joseph are given the news. And Bethlehem is prepared. And they get there by means of an intervention of the Lord so that they have to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And while they are there, this scripture is profound. The time is fulfilled. Now what that would mean in the natural is that it's Mary's time to give birth. But what it means in the supernatural is it's God's time to redeem his people. Oh, don't miss it today, church. This is the time of fulfillment. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Verse 7, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths, and she placed him in a manger. In many ways, you could say that God built a manger. God prepared a manger. God had a plan that included a manger. Again, another symbol, another picture. We forget sometimes that a cross is a sign of death and a manger is a feeding trough. But Christ takes the ordinary things that we know, 
ordinary people in this story and now an ordinary city like Bethlehem and then whatever's on hand, a feeding trough for the animals where they would have put the hay to feed the animals. And God knows in all of this that that's where he's going to place. That's where Mary is going to, having conceived of Jesus, Having, has, as he breathes his first breath as a human, 100% God, 100% human, as he is placed in that manger, God's presence has come to the earth and is wrapped in flesh and is now lying in a manger. It's an incredible thing. She wrapped him in claws and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Let's take the story further to the big reveal. See, if this story ends here and you have Mary and Joseph and they're quietly in this beautiful place, it's a silent night and Jesus is away in a manger, then it's just a beautiful story and it talks about how God comes to some. But no, there's something more that I want you to grab a hold of today in verse eight. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. See, up till this point, the story kind of is normal. Okay, two people gave birth. There wasn't room in the inn. They're in a stable. That's a bit unusual. There's a baby now laying in a manger, but now the big reveal is it's not just a baby. It's the Messiah. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And as the shepherds hear this news, suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angels praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace on those on whom his favor rests. Remember that God's favor was lying on Mary and the angels are announcing it's not just a favor that will lie upon Mary, it is a favor that rests on all those on whom God would bring peace to the earth through his son. Verse 15, when the angels had left When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is an incredible story. We've heard it so many times before. It won't be the last time we'll hear it. It won't be the last Christmas where we understand this truth, but to this year, this time, this moment, can I help you to see something that I pray you've already seen, but if you haven't, would it come just resting into your spirit today? The birth of Jesus was a demonstration of the love of God, and it was God's presence coming to the earth. And his presence was in that manger, Jesus lying in a manger, but his presence was doing more than that. It was coming to an earth that was in desperate need of a God who would draw near. And when he draws near, he invites all of us through all humanity from that time over 2,000 years ago till today, the invitation has been going forward that we might enjoy the presence of God, not in the manger. Jesus is not in the manger anymore. Jesus is now available to us by faith that he might come into us. We've been talking a lot about a manger and building a manger and getting a manger ready for the church and, 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 and having Jesus there, but the reality is that it's all a type and a picture. Yes, he came and he 
came to this earth in a literal sense, and he lived on the earth, and he didn't just live on the earth, but he taught great things. He taught, and we read about that throughout the scripture, but he didn't just teach, and he did miracles, signs, and wonders proving his divinity and God's favor on him, And but that's not all he did. He took it to the cross where many years later, 33 years later, he died, spread out his arms on the cross, and paid what the Bible says was a sinner's penalty for sin, so that God might be truly just to judge sin, but also truly loving to accept you and I by that free sacrifice of Jesus. I've been studying the word of God for many years, and I've been living for the Lord for many years, and the reality is there's part of it that's a mystery, and part of it you begin to understand as you open the pages of Scripture, but the reality is this is what the Scripture teaches. This is what God has communicated through his word that he has taken Jesus' sacrifice on the cross of Calvary to be a propitiation, a, a sacrifice, a payment for our sins, that if we would believe on that sacrifice, believe on Jesus, put our faith and trust in Jesus, that by doing so, we can be forgiven of God. For the sin and the sin nature and the, and the devastating way in which we live our lives. God isn't looking for polished up people and finished people. He's looking for a people who would be humble enough to say, I can't get it together on my own. And this Christmas we remember that the significance of Luke chapter 2 was not really about the manger. Jesus came, he laid in a manger, maybe for a night, maybe two. And then he was removed from the manger and they would have gone on to other places and we don't know a lot about those details, but he he certainly didn't stay in the manger long. But why had he come to the manger? Why was he there? Not to dwell in a manger on our mantelpiece, although I think that symbol is beautiful. He came that we might know that God loves us and that we might know that God invites us to, through the sacrifice of Jesus, receive him into our life, that this heart of ours would be like a manger, prepared, Trusting that God truly has a plan for our life. Just trusting and saying, God, I may not understand it all, but I trust that you have a plan for my life. And trusting that he wants to indwell within me. I don't understand that, but that he wants his son Jesus to come into my heart by faith, by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit within me, that I could be a part of his plan on the earth. And really, every person has a heart, an open manger, an empty manger, a manger that is not filled, a manger that is prepared. And maybe today your heart is hardened to the things of religion because you've seen the way man truly messes it up so many times. Maybe you're here today, you're a believer, but you just think, you know, I'm just not sure how much I I appreciate that. That that happened, but I don't see how it impacts my life. And so your heart becomes hardened with all the other things of this world. And and Jesus is in there, but he's crowded out by other things. And I would encourage all of us today to take a fresh look at the heart, the place where we make the choices in our life, our will, our desires, to say, Jesus, I want you in the center of every desire, every decision. I want you there. And mostly, Jesus, I need you there because without it, my life is doomed. Without it, my life is pointless. But with you in my life, I can be saved. With you in my life, you can dwell in that holy place. You know, earlier, we were uh, watching Maggie come into this place, and she ran up to this manger, and I noticed right before she left, She said something. And I've been thinking about that as I've been preaching this morning. I think Maggie got it earlier. Earlier, Maggie said she'd been learning a lot and she'd really been getting this thing figured out. And she said she had built a really nice backdrop. Can I tell you something about the backdrop of the manger? The manger is not a backdrop, it is the centerpiece. It's the centerpiece of this entire Christmas season. 
And I wish that Maggie, Maggie, hi Maggie. I wish she'd have gotten it. Hey Maggie, how are you? Yeah, that's it. You know what? Do you mind if I do this? You remembered. I remembered. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. See, what hasn't happened yet and needs to happen today is to remember that the manger is the place for Jesus to reside. The manger this morning represents Jesus in your heart. And uh, you know what, Maggie? I think this is what we need to do today. If the manger is not just the backdrop, then will you help me? Yeah. I think instead it should be the centerpiece of our service and the centerpiece of our life. Thank you, Maggie. See, in all seriousness today, we've had a lot of fun with this skit. But I want you to understand something today, kids, adults, Christians, seekers. I mean this with all my heart today. A life lived with an empty manger is not a life worth living. A life lived without Jesus in the center is meaningless, it's pointless. See, Christmas is not meaningful. I, I love tradition. I love the way my family comes together. I enjoy time with my family. I like to get gifts. I love to be around a Christmas tree and, and, and sing carols. I, I, love to, I, I love everything about it, but I'm... I have to tell you, without Jesus in the center of everything, everything is meaningless. It, even, if it, even if it means we feel a little happiness and a little joy, it's going to fade. When the toys break and when the family has gone home, we're going to feel that emptiness and sometimes greater than we ever felt it before. If there's not something more to Christmas then all of the things that we do to prepare for it, none of it makes sense unless Jesus is it. That's what makes the Christmas story incredible. The greatest gift of God was his presence in our midst. And even today, yes, I know it was over 2,000 years ago that Jesus came. I get that. But today, he is here. His presence the Bible says it if in Ephesians chapter 3. It's an incredible scripture if we can pull that up for just a moment. Verse 16 says this. Can you listen to this today with fresh ears? I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you. Listen to the power of the word here. This is what the Lord is saying to us. I pray he may strengthen you with power through his spirit, his Holy Spirit, in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. In other words, through believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That Christ, by his spirit, lives inside of us. His Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of Jesus, which is the Spirit of God, and he comes and he dwells in us so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's what I desire for you today. Listen, believer, you say, well, I've already received Jesus in my heart by faith, but believer, let me ask you today, let me ask myself, Am I allowing Jesus to be fully Lord of my life? 
Is he everything? Do I understand the significance of him being in the midst of my family time later tonight? Do I understand the significance of coming to him in prayer daily and saying, Lord, I want to center my life around you? Have I built a manger that is worthy for the Jesus, the Son of Man, to indwell within me by his Spirit? Or is my life crowded in mounts? Or maybe you're here today and you've been to church and you've done some traditional things but you're thinking, I don't know if Jesus is personally my Lord and Savior. We're going to, in just a few moments, light some candles. It's one of my favorite times of the Christmas season. It's beautiful when it happens. But before we do that and we begin to make space in our service for that, can you close your eyes today? And I just want to ask you, everybody across the room, even kids, if you just close your eyes for just a moment, this is not just for the adults. The Bible says we have to come to the Lord with a childlike faith, and you've got that already. It's built into you. But we come in faith, so today I just want to give you this opportunity to spend that moment with the Lord. What makes this service significant and what makes what we're doing today significant is that Jesus is here. And what is important to us as a church and I hope to you, is that we make space for the presence of God, not our tradition, but the presence of God. And I just believe something right now. If we'll leave just a few moments here, and if you would cry out to the Lord from your seat where you are today and just say, Jesus, come into my life. Maybe you've never believed in that he truly is who he says he is. Maybe today you're understanding for the first time that, my goodness, I, I realize now that God really has done this thing for me and my family. And if that's you, would you just cry out to the Lord right now? The Bible says that we come to faith in Jesus by repenting, turning away from our life of sin, not working our way to him, but just simply making a decision that says, Lord, I am done doing this on my own. I repent of all my efforts to be made right, to do right, to try to be religious, to just try to be a good person. I realize all of that will fall short according to your word. It says, we all have fallen short of the glory of God, and if a man sins in even one point, he has violated the entire law, and I certainly have done that more than once, and so, Lord, I am guilty that you would just say to the Lord today, Lord, I repent of my sins, and I want to believe you by faith that the presence of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross might pay for my sins, and I want Jesus to come by faith, by your spirit, and reside on the inside of me. I prepare my heart like a manger today. Come, reside in me. If that's your prayer before the Lord, just pray this to the Lord. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you to myself. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, paid fully, and now, Lord, I receive you. I want you to be Lord of my life. I need you to change me from the inside out, and I look forward to being with you in heaven one day, for you are the way, the truth, and the life, and I come to you today through you, for salvation. In Jesus' name. And if you're here today, you're a believer, you say, Pastor, I've prayed that prayer, I get what you're saying, but my life is not reflecting it. As we go to the candlelight service today, and we start to move about, and, and candlelight will come towards you in just a moment, I want to encourage you, as we sing Silent Night and sing together, that you might say, Jesus, let the light of Christ dwell in me. Let my life not be crowding out the importance of Jesus in this season. I'm gonna ask at this time that our elders would come and we're gonna invite the staff to come up on the platform and our families and so we can do this as a family. Gonna invite you guys to come up, yeah. Come on up. 
One of the things that we're understanding as a church is that we are, uh, we're a family's church. We're a church that has lots of incredible families. And we will never shy away from the fact that whether you're a single person or whether you have a family of 18 or 19, we all are part of the family of God. I want to ask if you'd stand to your feet and you can prepare your candles. If you didn't get any candles, we have some in the back here and uh, maybe if we had a few that could help you out there, but you can grab your candles now and it'll take a little moment for us to light them, but this is such an incredible moment. And I encourage you with a couple things, help your kids however you can. We do have small little votive uh, battery-powered ones for the, the wee little ones among us. There's some more of those in the back as well. And right now we're lighting from this. We, we mentioned at the beginning of service, and we, we prayed a lot about this. You'll notice there's an empty candle there at the middle. That's the Christ candle. There's only four Sundays this year because we didn't have a separate Christmas Eve, but we said, you know what? This year, we want to light that Christ candle. We want you to take your bags after you leave today, and in each one, there's a beautiful candle in a little votive, and we want you to, if you would, in part of your Christmas Eve, to light that candle, the candle of Christ, and let it burn brightly within our hearts as families as we celebrate who Christ is, and so... Um, did you bring my candle up? I don't know where it went. Ah! They, they're on top of me. Oh! Wonderful. So as we, uh, she's okay. Are you okay? Come on. All right. Here we go. Thank you, Tim. Want to remind you just logistically, once your candle is lit, keep it straight up in the air. And if you want to light a candle, bend it. Bend the knee. That's how it is with Christ. If you want to get your candle lit, you got to bend the knee. Hallelujah. Uh, just thought of that. That's brilliant. Thank you, Lord. That's a... No, I know it wasn't, but, you know, I'm a dad, so it, it makes sense. It works. So praise the Lord. I'm going to ask at this time that the elders begin to light the rest of the candles, and we'll begin to bring the lights out. In just a few moments, Mary's going to sing for us. We've got her here with uh, kids in tow, ready to go, and that would only be appropriate, but... I want to pray for you. You can keep your eyes open as candlelight comes towards you, but I want to pray over you today before we get ready to sing. Father, we just, as a matter of fact, you can just leave your eyes open for the prayer. Doesn't that seem weird? Lord, we just thank you for your presence here today. Your presence is rich. It's spiritual. It's not something we see with these eyes, but we, what we do see with these eyes is the family of God together. So many throughout this room who have called upon you as our Lord and Savior. And Lord, that's one of the beauties of your presence in us. Creates a atmosphere of the family of God, that we join a family, not just at LAC, but all across this beautiful community in Lewisburg. Many of you are from other churches that are joining us today, and we welcome you. Some of you are visiting from out of town, and you're part of other churches that are a part of the body of Christ that we are family with, and all around the world today, and missionaries that we pray for throughout the entire year, there are people who are celebrating Jesus. Just like this light spreads across the room today, we pray that Jesus would light in your hearts and that we would know that it is Jesus, his presence in us. And Christian, believer, anyone, as we're singing, would you continue to say to the Lord, I want you to burn brightly in my heart. I want Jesus to be at the center of everything I do. And Lord, we worship you today as the God, the living God who came to earth to be with us. Mary, would you lead us out? Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child. Oh.
So, Lord, we praise you this morning and this Christmas Eve for the light of the light of this world, the light of the Son of Man that shone down on us, shines down on us today. And, Lord, as your life is in us, may we not hide it under a bushel. May we not keep it from shining around us as we go today that others may know the message of the gospel foretold in the scriptures that Jesus Christ has come, the light of the world, and now resides in us a city on a hill that we might declare it to the world, Jesus saves. We thank you and we praise you today in the name of Jesus. Come on, let the church say amen, amen. amen. Come on, give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. As you go today, we invite you just to, to continue to fellowship together. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. God bless you all. Have a great rest of the day and a great Christmas tomorrow. God bless.